with the goal of, oh, there we go. Right. <laughs> with the goal of advancing um, invasive species um, education and outreach and management in the Finger Lakes region. So we cover a 17 county area that you can see over here. Pretty much everything um, between Rochester and Syracuse, all the Finger Lakes. Um, and everything south of Lake Ontario and north of uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, there, we are one of eight prisms and there are sister organizations that do work similar to what we do. I'm just gonna check the chat right here, um, making sure I'm not missing anything. Um, there, so we're one of eight regional prisms in New York State. Uh, there are sister organizations that do work similar to what we do, just in different parts of the state. So if you go out west, um, you know, west of Rochester here, you'll be in uh, in the Buffalo area, and there's the Western New York Prism. Um, if you go to New York City and Long Island, there's Long Island Prism. If you go to the Adirondacks, there's the Adirondack Prism, so on and so forth. So we're here tonight to talk about invasive species and invasive species are a huge environmental issue. Um, it gets a lot of attention in the news. And I think, you know, when we're talking about invasive species, I think these three pictures do a really good job of showing uh, some of the damage that invasive species have caused. And these are three different invasive species. In the top left here, we have um, a forest uh, whose trees have been defoliated by um, gypsy moth, now known as spongy moth um, in Pennsylvania. You can see um, we have thousands and thousands of trees in this photo have been completely defoliated, all of this brown that's stretching off into the horizon. Um, in this picture in the bottom left here, we have a car that's being pulled out of a lake that's covered in all of this crud. And if any of you are familiar with um, zebra mussels, then um, you're going to know a lot about situations like these. Zebra mussels cover people's boats, they cover people's cars, they cover people's canoes. Um, it's one of the worst aquatic invasive species that we have in our region, all the Finger Lakes and Lake Ontario. And then finally here, um, this is on the right, this is not an invasive species that we have in our region just yet, although climate change might have something to say about that. Um, this is an invasive vine called kudzu. Um, it's known as the vine that ate the south. Um, and you can see here, it's just completely carpeted all of these trees, all of the ground here. And you can imagine that if you are a plant or animal, it's living in this forest, you're not having a great time. So with all that being said, you know, what makes an invasive species invasive? Well, the way we can define an invasive species is just any organism that is non-native to an ecosystem and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. Generally, there is a set of characteristics that most invasive species share with one another. Um, they generally have a very high reproductive rate. They're generally very aggressive, so they just grow really quickly. They often have no natural predators in their invasive range because they typically have very low nutritional value. You sort of think of them as the potato chips of the natural world. Um, and finally, uh, I think this is sort of a point that doesn't get as much attention as it should. They're really good at taking advantage of human disturbance. So as we humans continue to change um, our landscapes and continue to build new structures and create new ecosystems, it turns out that invasive species are really well adapted to living in these new environments. And often this includes trails and we often see invasive species growing along trail sides. And so you might be thinking, well, like, how does this even happen? Like, how, how, how does a problem like invasive species even begin? Well, invasive species can be introduced to a new region for a, a myriad of different reasons, either intentionally or simply by accident. Um, through the pathways can sometimes include things like international trade, the pet trade, or landscaping plants. But generally, for our purposes here, and um, sort of the eastern half of North America, when we're talking about invasive species, we're often getting them from either Eastern Asia or from Europe. There's two reasons for that. One is that these are the two parts of the world that are the most similar climactically to our own. So there's four seasons, hot summers, cold winters. These are species that are gonna be able to do pretty well um, with the environmental conditions that we have. And then secondly, these are just the two parts of the world that we in the United States are just simply the most connected with, right? These are the two parts of the world where we have the most trade going back and forth. We have the most tourism going back and forth. Um, you know, we don't have as much trade with, let's say, a region like Madagascar as we do with a place like China or maybe Italy, right? And so as people and goods are moving and crisscrossing across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, um, invasive species are often coming along for the ride. Once they get here, costs 
are very widespread. Economic, environmental, human health, we're just gonna kind of breeze through this a little bit. Um, getting to, to the sort of dollars and cents of it, invasive species have directly contributed to hundreds of species extinctions worldwide, like the golden toad over there, and the decline of thousands more. Um, and then even economically in the US, we annually spend $120 billion each year, $120 billion controlling invasive species. So not only are invasive species a huge ecological issue, but they are a massive financial one as well. Oftentimes when it comes to invasive species, um, we just don't know where they are. Um, despite all the damage that they can cause, invasive species have a really good habit of spreading much faster than we are able to keep up with. And so that is sort of the whole point as to why I'm here tonight, um, is to sort of uh, let you guys know ways that you can help us detect the spread of invasive species before um, they get out of control. Oftentimes when we talk about invasive species and how they're able to spread, we can sort of visualize that as the invasion curve. And after two years of COVID, I think we're all used to looking at graphs that look a lot like this. Basically, um, what we're trying to do is catch invasive species over here on the left side of the graph, when the area that in, an invasive species that they infest um, is going to be rather low and therefore the costs of controlling and then removing that invasive species are going to be low. So we wanna sort of nip these invasions in the bud before they can cause any damage um, when eradication is still feasible, as opposed to waiting until they completely take over an area and the costs of controlling that invasive species are so high because the area that they infest is so large. And that's just kind of hammering the point home there. So um, this is really just about an opportunity for you to learn about um, different invasive species that uh, you might find on the trail. And there are plenty of invasive species out there. If you're not someone who has a good plant background, then you're probably not familiar with the fact that many of the plant species you see while hiking are invasive species. And so we're here today to give you tools that you can use to help us stop invasive species and protect the hiking trails that you love so much. We have two different ways that you can participate if you'd like to be a volunteer. There are the trail trackers and the trail masters. Um, trail trackers is um, sort of designed for beginners in mind. So if you're someone who doesn't know a single invasive species or any invasive or any native or invasive um, plants or animals at all, this is exactly um, something for you. All we ask you to do as part of a trail tracker is that you would survey um, twice a month on any trail that you choose in June, July, or August. Uh, we're gonna teach you seven different invasive species. All of them are very easy to ID. One emerging invasive species, so this is an invasive species that is just beginning to spread in our region. And one um, more established invasive species that is very widespread and you're gonna find on any hiking trail pretty easily. The survey methods for the for being a trail tracker is pretty simple. You just spot the inv invasive species that you find. And we just had our very first training for this last night. It's a quick 30 minute training, um, but we're gonna be having our second training for this for folks who couldn't make it to the first on May 24th. I believe that is a Tuesday. So if you're interested in that, uh, I'll be passing along some information for that afterwards. Trail Masters is more advanced. This is if you already know how to identify um, plants and animals pretty well. In this course, we're gonna teach you how to learn over 20 different invasive species. You're gonna survey once a month on the same trail. There's a bit of a more complex survey method when it comes to being a trail master that we'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, and we haven't started trainings for that just yet, but we're gonna have two on um, two Wednesday, excuse me, the 18th and another on June 7th. Um, so that's just sort of the groundwork is the different ways that you can participate. I'm just gonna open up this chat here so it can go away. So um, surveying, the way that surveying works, um, if you're gonna be a trail master, is that you would hike down the trail and every 50 feet, you're gonna imagine a, a circle sort of around you with a radius of 50 feet, and you're just gonna identify and map all of the invasive species that you see in that area with your phone. Um, it can 
if you're someone who really likes to look at a lot of different um, plants, and there's definitely a lot of invasive plants for you to look for when you're out hiking, um, this is definitely the program for you. And if you're interested, we're going to go into a lot more detail for this um, in our upcoming trainings next week and two weeks from now. Oh, come on. There we go. Okay, so if you are interested in being a trail tracker, none of this applies to you. Being a trail tracker is super simple. All you have to do is just note the invasive species that you find with your phone. Um, you don't have to stop every 50 feet. There's no imaginary circle around you. You just go down the trail. If you see invasive species, that's great. If you don't, that's fine. Um, it's a much simpler way to do it. And we'll talk a little bit more later as to how the actual reporting works. But the way that both of these programs um, operate on is that you would actually, there's an app for your phone that you can use to um, record invasive species um, that you see. And all of that information is then entered into a database that we can use to make um, decisions about where to fight invasive species next. So the way this works is that, again, the trail survey, we're identifying, surveying for, and reporting invasive species in the Finger Lakes region. Anyone can participate with a smartphone or a tablet, and you can survey anywhere you want. It could be any trail near you. It's completely your choice. Um, I get a lot of questions often that, you know, should I be surveying, um, should I worry about surveying trails that other people have already surveyed. Our region is so under-surveyed and we have so many trails that haven't been surveyed yet that in all honesty, um, that if you're surveying a trail, it's highly likely that you were the very first person to be surveying for it. It doesn't, it, it doesn't have to be a crazy long trail. You don't, we're not asking you to hike the entire FLT. Um, it could just be a small trail near you. It could be even in your local park or even on your land. It's completely your choice as to where you survey. Um, and the way that data is collected is that we ask you to go out into the field at least three times. Um, if you're a trail tracker, we ask that you go out um, twice a month in June, July, and August. So that's two times in each month. Um, if you're a trail master, we ask that you, you only need to go out on a trail once a month, um, but we ask that you go out on the same trail in June, July, and August. So I hope that makes sense. Either way, no matter which program you participate in, you're gonna be going out at least once in the three summer months. And so why are we surveying trails? So trails, just like housing developments and highways, are areas that are frequently disturbed. Human foot traffic coming through, trail clearing, these conditions that we create on trail sides um, create um, the right environment for invasive species to often invade. And we often see that the edges of forest have very different environmental conditions than the interior of the forest. So often we'll see, um, you know, warmer temperatures, lower moisture, and invasive species are really well adapted to these edges of trails as opposed to the interior. So you most often find invasive species along trail sides as opposed to the interior of the forest. And as a part of this program, um, we're not asking anyone to survey, you know, deep in the woods. You don't have to go off trail. Um, every, we're just asking anything you see on the trail that you would report. And this is often a scene that we see along trail sites. Um, this is a stand of Japanese knotweed that's crowding out a trail. And there is actually a trail in this picture. This little brown um, sliver is, <laughs> is the trail that you're supposed to be hiking through. Um, and it's very common and increasingly common, I should say, that we are seeing situations like what this little girl is in, being swallowed up by invasive species along trail sides. So there's three steps to taking part. Um, in trying to tackle different invasive species. There's identifying the invasive species, surveying for the invasive species, which we already talked about a little bit, and then there's reporting those invasive species. Um, when it comes to identifying invasive species, um, it's fairly simple, and we teach you how to identify all the invasive species that you're going to um, be looking for if you'd like to participate. Um, but just for fun, we're going to go through a few different invasive species that people will commonly encounter along trails and whether or not you decide to actually report any of the invasive species you see after tonight, um, it's still good to know just invasive species that you usually find. Um, and of course, we teach you how to identify all the invasive species. Um, so our first plant that we got here are the swallowworts, black and pale. Um, this can grow sort of a vine or a weed. 
Swallow weren't um, the, not really a huge difference between being black or pale. The main things you need to know about these guys is that um, they are sort of a herbaceous, viney. They kind of really like to grow around other plants. Um, they'll have these long tapering leaves that are pointed. They'll have an opposite leaf arrangement. So they'll have one leaf on each side of the stem. Um, and they'll have these really interesting, um, and you'll see this more in July, these sort of star-shaped flowers. Um, once those star-shaped flowers are pollinated, they'll become these really long, thin, tapering seed pods. They're actually in the same family as milkweeds. And so um, a big problem with swallowworts is that monarch butterflies will often lay their eggs on, on them instead of milk, mistaking them for milkweeds. And um, it turns out swallowworts are actually toxic. To mark. So they've been having a huge impact on our monarch butterfly populations. There we go. Uh, so then we have Japanese knotweed. That's uh, the invasive species that we just saw in the uh, pictures a few slides ago. Uh, Japanese knotweed is really aggressive. Um, you'll often find it even just growing in your yard. It lives in the yard of my apartment right over here. Um, the main thing you could use to identify Japanese knotweed or the large leaves. So these really big circular leaves are often larger than your hand. Um, so if you ever see a plant with these huge, I mean, huge circular leaves, odds are it's probably Japanese knotweed. Um, the other main thing that you can use to identify them is actually just the shoots themselves. Japanese knotweed um, is not really closely related to bamboo at all, but when you're actually looking at the stem of a knotweed plant, it really closely resembles bamboo. So if you see something that kind of looks like bamboo, but it has these really big circular leaves, that's often a sign that what you're looking at is Japanese knotweed. Um, next, we have garlic mustard. This is a weed. Garlic mustard is a really interesting plant um, because it's uh, a biennial, so that means it's not an annual where it only lives for one year, and it's not a um, perennial where it comes back every year. Just like carrots, garlic mustard will only live for two growing seasons. In the very first growing season, garlic mustard will be very small and close to the ground, and it'll have these uh, more circular shaped leaves. They'll kind of have an indent in them that actually, I don't know, to me, it kind of makes them look like horseshoes. If you're looking at this picture at the top, like I'm thinking like this leaf right here, kind of, you know, kind of resembles like a really fat horseshoe. Um, garlic mustard has a really fun way that you can identify it, where you take the leaves in either ear, and you actually um, crush them between your fingers, um, it'll have a really garlicky, mustardy kind of smell to it. And in second year, garlic mustard will start shooting up. It can often get to about two to three feet tall. The leaves will actually change shape during this time, and they'll become triangular. Um, and you can see that in this picture in the bottom right here. You can see these triangular leaves. And then um, they haven't flowered yet, but right now, they should be flowering pretty soon within the next few weeks or so. Um, once they flower, they'll have these little white flowers on the very top. Garlic mustard is a pretty um, spring, not necessarily a spring ephemeral, but it's a strong spring plant. So you often see it um, in times like right now, like in May and early June. This is when they really tend to dominate the landscape. Garlic mustard is a really big problem because it often outcompetes native plants because it's allelopathic. And what that means is that um, they actually inject um, toxic chemicals and poisons into the ground through their root systems that kill plants around them. And so garlic mustard can often clear out the understory of a forest of native plants just because they're quite literally killing them, not because they're, um, you know, uh, overshadowing them or anything like that because they're literally injecting poison into the ground. It's really interesting how they're able to do that. Um, another fun thing about garlic mustard is that it is edible. You can eat the leaves, you can cook them. It tastes kind of weird, but I've heard some people do like it, so give it a try. Um, next we have Japanese honeysuckle. Um, Japanese honeysuckle is originally native to Eastern Asia, as the name implies. Um, this is a woody shrub. It should be flowering soon. And the flowers are really easy um, to tell apart from most plants. They will be sort of trumpet shaped, as you can see in this picture here, um, usually white. The leaves on Japanese honeysuckle are going to be opposite. So most plants um, have what's called an alternate leaf arrangement. We already kind of talked about this before, um, where you'll have one leaf on each side of the stem. Japanese honeysuckle, just like um, some other plants, 
will have an opposite leaf arrangement. Now, having an opposite leaf arrangement isn't necessarily something that is either native or invasive, like maple trees and ash trees, for instance, have opposite leaf arrangements. But for the most part, most plants have an alternate leaf arrangement. So when we say that something has an opposite leaf arrangement, it usually helps that plant stand out a little bit more amongst its peers. This will generally grow as sort of a shrub, you know, just kind of that big generic shrub sort of shape. The leaves are going to be pretty small, um, circular, oval in shape. And then really the big way that you can tell Japanese honeysuckle apart from other plants is that the stem is actually hollow on the inside. So if you just take a stem and you break it open, it literally looks like an empty tube. Um, this is a feature that is really only found on honeysuckles. Um, it's not really common in, in any of the native or other invasive plants that we have. Um, and so that's really a good way to tell apart honeysuckle from um, other native and invasive plants. Um, you know, the impact of Japanese honeysuckles is much like a lot of other invasive species. They have very few natural enemies, and because um, they don't have any predators feeding on them, they're able to outcompete native species. Slender false brome. Um, this is a grass species originally native to Eurasia and Northern Africa. Um, grass can be really hard to identify, but slender false brome has a few things that make it a lot easier to identify than most grass species. For one, slender false brome, um, like most of these plants, is usually growing in the middle of the woods. It's not really going to be growing in your yard as much, although it certainly could. Slender false brome, um, the leaves will often have these really fine hairs on them. And you can see that in this picture at the top here, these sorts of rows of fine hairs going up and down the leaves and the stems of slender false brome. Um, they'll often grow in these clumps that you could see in the, um, the bottom picture here. So if you ever see grass in the middle of the woods and there's just clumps everywhere, um, odds are it's probably slender false brome. It's really similar to if you ever get like crabgrass, like clumps like growing in your yard, it's kind of like that. And then just like um, Japanese honeysuckle, um, slender false brome, the stems are actually hollow on the inside as well. And you can use that to tell slender false brome apart from pretty much um, most of the other native and invasive grass species that we have in our region. And just like all invasive species, slender false brome will form these aggressive, dense monocultures. They can grow in a wide variety of conditions. And as we're talking about these invasive plants here, um, I think it's worth saying that Deer do not eat any of these plants. Deer really only go after the native plant species. When it comes to the invasive plants, they generally lack the nutrition that deer need. A Japanese barberry, you might even have this growing in your front lawn. Um, this is an ornamental. Um, it's pretty easy to tell apart from most other plants. It's a shrub. They'll usually have as an ornamental this sort of red leaf coloration, but once it gets into the wild, they'll have these green leaves. Leaves super duper tiny, like smaller than your fingernail size. Um, and they'll grow in these whorls. So like literally they'll be growing in these sort of circles or like a rosette to sort of think about it um, on the stem as um, the name barberry implies, it has these barbs on it. So ja uh, Japanese barberry do need to be careful if you're going near it because it does have um, lots and lots of thorns. Um, and then later on in the year, they're gonna get these oblong red berries growing on them. Uh, berries are actually edible, so you might wanna give them a try when you're on this trail. Then we have multiflora rose, another plant that has thorns on it. Uh, multiflora rose, if it isn't flowering yet, will be flowering soon. Um, big reason why people plant it is because it has these really brilliant white flowers. Multiflora rose can either grow as a sort of a single stem of roses or as a huge shrub. Um, these often grow along um, like river sides and creek sides, but it could really be found in any sort of environment, like most invasive species. Uh, multiflora rose um, has a lot of the same characteristics that most of our native and invasive rose species have. So they'll have the same flower structures as roses. They'll have rose hips, which are the fruits that roses create, and they'll have compound leaves as well. The main way that you can tell multiflora rose apart from other rose species is that if you're looking at the leaf, so then the bottom picture, this whole structure is a single leaf. It's called a compound leaf. Each one of these, um, what looks like a leaf is a leaflet, is what we call it. At the very base, you can see here, there's these little 
horns or these two um, spikes that are coming out of the very base of that leaf. That is a feature that is only found in multiflora rose. It's not found in any of the native or other invasive rose species that we have. So if you're looking at a plant and you see that it has thorns and it has these white flowers and compound leaves, but you're really not sure, maybe it's a native rose, um, look at the very base of the leaf and it's gonna have those um, like little devil horns. And finally, um, the only animal that we really only talk about when it comes to invasive animals you're gonna find on the trail, um, spotted lanternfly. This is the big one. Um, like 90% of, um, of the education work I do is about spotted lanternfly. Spotted lanternfly is the really, really bad invasive species that we have. Um, first detected in Pennsylvania in 2014, it is rapidly spreading throughout the United States. States. Spotted lanternfly is really concerning to us because it loves to feed on grape trees, excuse me, grape vines, apple trees, and hops vines. And so when you think about the agriculture that we have in the Finger Lakes, you know, that's it. Spotted And so spotted lanternfly is really an existential threat to our local and regional economy. Um, right now, spotted lanternfly has only been found in the Ithaca and Binghamton areas, but because they like to lay their eggs on cars, um, they can pretty much pop up in any region at any given time. Spotted lanternfly is an interesting life cycle. Um, it's a really vividly colored insect, and so it's really easy to pick out for the most part. Um, it'll they'll lay these sort of egg masses that will be sort of a gray smear on a tree, be kind of shiny sometimes in coloration. Once they hatch, and they're probably hatching right about now, um, if they haven't hatched yet, maybe in the next week or so, They'll be very small, black with white spots. They'll keep feeding throughout the spring and summer and they'll gradually get larger in size. Um, and then eventually they'll reach their last instar or nymph stage and they'll start getting these red stripes um, down their bodies. This is when they get close to adult size. And then in August, but definitely by September, um, these nymphs are gonna become fully fledged adults. This is when spotted lanternfly grows its wings um, now they're able to fly around and reproduce. The wings of spotted lanternfly um, are really vivid. They are pink with black spots. If you think you've seen a spotted lanternfly, you know, something with pink wings and black spots, odds are you're probably looking at it. It's a really inv easy invasive species to detect. Um, but uh, spotted lanternfly is going to be most active in this adult stage later on in the fall. So don't be looking for something that looks like this right now. You're going to really be looking for something more um, like this in the top. This is going to be much uh, more prevalent in late summer, early fall. Um, spotted lanternfly is also a really big problem in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and a lot of the states that are um, south of us. So if you're ever hiking in those areas, uh, make sure that you're checking your car for egg masses. They like to lay their eggs on cars. That's what's enabled them to spread so far so quickly. If you're ever, you know, curious about how to identify different invasive species, and I know I just threw a lot of information at you guys, um, but if you'd like to practice how to survey for different invasive species, um, this is not the app that we use to report invasive species. Um, but it is a really helpful app. It's called Seek. Um, pretty much you just point it at any native or invasive species that you find, and it will do its best to try to um, identify it for you. So I pointed it right at my ferret, and it correctly identified it as a European polecat, as you can see. Just something that I personally like to use a lot. And I find it really helpful. So reporting. So Seek is not the app that we use to report invasive species. It's run by um, iNaturalist and National Geographic. We use an app that is called iMap Invasives. Um, this is an app that you can get on your phone. It works with any phone, um, Android or iPhone. You can get it on the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store for free. Um, basically, this app is a way that you can upload um, invasive species into the official database of invasive species that we have for New York. So these points that if you decide to take them aren't just centered in into you know some random um, database somewhere that no one looks at. Um, this is a database that we use to help um, track the spread of invasive species, but also New York State Parks uses this. Um, the DEC uses this. Uh, Finger Lakes Trail uses this. Every major conservation player in New York State 
use design map invasives when they're trying to make decisions about what invasive species to treat or not to treat. So if you do decide to take part in our trail survey program, um, it's really simple to make an account. Um, you can just make it right on your phone, download the app, and just make sure that if you do decide to um, saddle up with us, um, that you go online, so on the actual um, browser version of IMAP Invasives, and that you just join the Finger Lakes Prism Volunteer Trail Survey. If you have any questions about how to do this um, or would like to know more, uh, feel free to just shoot me an email or come to any of our trainings and we explain how this process works in a little bit. Um, it's really easy to take points with IMAP Invasives. Um, to add an observation, all you do is just take a photo using your camera Excuse me, my phone is going off. Just gonna silence this right here. Um, then you're just going to select um, from a drop down menu the species that you think you're looking at. There are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of invasive species um, on that list. So you have a lot of different options to choose from. You can say whether you detected or not detected that species. For the most part, you'll probably just be making positive observations. So you'll be saying that you detected them. Um, for your project, you're just going to put in Finger Lakes Prism Volunteer Trail Survey. Um, you could skip everything with the map um, and just make sure that you're adding in the size of the area containing that invasive and the distribution of the invasive. And you just hit save at the very end. Um, once you have made your point, you'll be sort of greeted with this green screen and this little yellow card. That little yellow card is the observation that you made. Um, if you need to go back and make any changes, you can click on that little pencil there make any changes um, afterwards. Um, but once you make a point, and you could you can use this app in any conditions, even if you have no cell service, um, just once you make a point, you need to upload it manually. The observations aren't uploaded automatically for you. Um, so the only way that you need to do that is you just go to the very top left, you see these three little lines, you hit upload selected, and you just select that in that little checkbox right here. You just sit, okay, I want to upload that one record. And then once that yellow card is gone, that means your point has now been uploaded into the database. Super easy and simple to use. And the reason why we have um, people upload it manually is just because, um, you know, if you're out in the woods, you don't have any cell reception, um, you could just upload the points when you get home and you have either cell reception or Wi-Fi. And you might be thinking, does this even work? Is there any real point to me actually going out and like, making invasive species observations, like why do I care? Well, actually, yes, this does work. Um, the first spotted lantern by a population found in New York state was found in Ithaca by just a random passerby, not someone like me who works in the field, but by just someone who knew what they were looking for and knew it was an invasive species. Um, invasive species discoveries are made like this all the time, including this 12 year old who found um, invasive Asian clams in a lake in Minnesota. Um, a lot of the spotted lanternfly observations that have been made so far have been made just by um, normal volunteers. Um, I work in an office of like 10 people and we cover 17 counties. We just don't have the bandwidth to be on top of every single invasive species that's spreading all the time. And so you guys being out there, being the eyes and ears in the field um, can do a lot of great work in controlling the spread of invasive species. We have several upcoming trainings, if you are interested, um, available for both the trail trackers and the trail masters, their nifty little calendar right there. So Wednesday the 18th, the trail masters trainings, because they're more involved are generally an hour long, but the trail trackers trainings, um, because there's not as much invasive species that you need to know are usually only half an hour. So, you know, if you're, if you're interested, those are the sorts of time commitments. Um, that's pretty much most of what I have. Um, just wanted to give a little shout out for our the upcoming New York Invasive Species Awareness Week, otherwise known as NISA. Um, we're going to be holding events throughout um, June 6th through June 12th, both at the PRISM and different um, partner organizations, um, organizations like the Finger Lakes Trail, Finger Lakes Land Trust, all the major conservation organizations are going to be holding invasive species related events during this time. We're going to be doing documentary screenings, guided hikes, and kayaking and invasive species polls. If you're interested in taking part in any of these, um, go to our website, fingerlakesinvasives.org. We'll be posting a sort of calendar of all the different events we'll be having pretty soon. Um, should be a really exciting week coming up. 
Um, it's not too late to get started. We have our past trainings uploaded on YouTube, so if you can't make it to any of our trainings, you can find them there. We've got a Facebook group. Um, I also want to mention before I forget, um, there is a prize for whoever gets um, the most observations this summer. It's the first time we're doing anything like that. And the prize is going to be really cool. I haven't had a chance to get around to making it yet, um, but I have used this for different events in the past, and it is something you're probably going to want. Just put throwing that out there. Um, and if you have any questions, you can always email me um, either about uh, taking part in the trail survey or just about invasive species in general at gallo, G-A-L-L-O, at hws.edu. Um, I just wanted to sort of end the note here on talking about, you know, there's a lot of invasive species out there. Um, a lot of invasive species that you might have heard of um, or that uh, you haven't heard of that we have lost the battle to, things like the lash borer, things like the chestnut blight. Um, and there are a lot of invasive species that are so widespread that we now consider them to be native. Um, and so I just want to say that, um, you know, there's still a lot of time and energy that we need to fight these invasives. It's not um, to revolve doom and gloom. That's what we get into a lot, you know, in the environmental field, things can seem really negative at times, but you guys can really actually make a difference when it comes to fighting invasive species. So I just want to make sure that, you know, we're ending on a, on a positive note here. Um, so thank you all for coming tonight. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And if you don't want to ask any questions right now, you could always email me too, again, at gallo.hws.edu. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. Appreciate it. Oh, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Matt. I, I've been watching the chat and I have not seen any other questions to be answered. But if anybody wants to ask any questions now, please feel free to unmute yourselves and ask those questions. Terry Coffin here. I was curious about the Asian jumping worms, how far they are towards us in your prism area. Sorry, I was muted myself. <laughs> I think it was the first time I've ever uh, talked about forgetting to unmute myself. Um, yeah, they're everywhere, um, Asian jumping worms. Um, they often, their eggs can often attach to people's hiking boots and they're really hard to see. So they are pretty much all throughout our region at this point, um, Asian jumping worms. It's just sort of a question as to how, how many are there in your neck of the woods. Any other questions? Um, I see a direct message that I got from Janet. Um, these trainings take place over Zoom, Janet. If you're interested, um, actually, let me shoot the, um, the sign up link in the chat here in case anyone is interested. Just give me one second. Um, all of these trainings are over Zoom. We were thinking about having an option for in person trainings because I know everyone's like really Zoomed out right now. Um, but most of the folks that we got responses from, um, wanted to do these over Zoom, which makes sense, you know. Um, so I will just shoot this down in the chat if anyone wants to um, sign up. Oh, just got to get that to everyone. There we go. So if you're interested, just sign up on that Google form right there. Other than that, are there any other questions? No? I'm not seeing anything. So thank you, Matt, and thank you for everybody for coming tonight. I hope you have a very good night. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Have a good night, everyone. Bye.